Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to hear from Pamela Barnes in a moment, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. A presentation that, that she kindly agreed to prepare and deliver here today on her vision of sort of where we are today in mother-to-child transmission and as a, as a core prevention priority and what's the way forward to try and use that as an entry point in creating an AIDS-free generation. What are some of the key obstacles? How do we think about this in the midst of, of a worsening environment in terms of the global recession and the economic crisis we face here today? And the achievements that we're bringing forward is the legacy of the last several years of dramatic progress. This is an organization, the foundation, which has gone through some rather remarkable transformations in the last few years, what began as really a predominantly an American-focused organization, which is today really a very globalized and a predominantly African organization in a, in, a, in a way, and has been a very successful and innovative organization. And I think just another very glowing instance of the transformations that have happened to American inst private institutions as a result of a sort of expansion of engagement on global health and the way it's enriched all of us and created new partnerships and new skills and generation of ideas and employment that stretches well beyond our own boundaries. And, and I think we, we have a debt of gratitude to Pamela and to the Foundation's leadership for carrying, us, carrying this organization so far in such a short period of time. And so thank you, Pamela, for being with us, and thank you for your leadership and what your organization has contributed both on the domestic response pediatric AIDS, but also globally and, and particularly in Africa. Pamela brings more than 30 years of managerial experience and vision in both the profit and nonprofit sectors. Um, she's responsible for the Foundation's strategic programmatic fundraising financial and management operations as it's gone through this period of explosive growth. Prior to joining the Foundation, she served as a CEO and Vice President of Finance at the International Trachoma Initiative. Prior to that, <clears throat> Director of Operations and Finance for Planned Parenthood, Hudson Baconic in New York, uh, was a Peace Corps volunteer in Paraguay. And before the, her entry into the nonprofit world, she worked for more than 20 years in investment management and corporate finance in New York, including stints as Assistant Treasurer of Corporate Finance at GTE and assistant treasurer at ERCA. Very interesting sort of career path of crossover of skills between finance, corporate world, and into the nonprofit world. Uh, another instance of the way in which uh, the two have intersected in very productive and synergistic ways. So please join me in welcoming Pamela Barnes. She'll deliver her speech and address and then uh, be here to take comments and questions from all of you. In the, in, the, in the discussion period that will follow. So please join me in welcoming Pamela. Thank you, Steve, for that kind introduction. Um, two things I might say uh, in, uh, by way of thanking you for that. I have to say that maybe there's a sense of denial that I have about the fact that when someone starts off an introduction by talking about my more than 30 years of experience, I think, who are they talking about? <laughs> but thank you very much for that. It is indeed a great privilege uh, not only to be here and see many familiar faces, and thank you all for coming today. Um, but I'm also uh, reflecting on a brief conversation Steve and I had at the outset, and I heard it on the radio this morning, of course, that. Uh, Senator Clinton's confirmation hearings happen to be going on right now. I have to admit I never thought in my life that I'd be on a speaking platform as the senator was on a speaking platform. So uh, here we are. But again, I thank you all for coming today. Um, as Steve said, um, the foundation is truly an incredible organization. And not only am I truly delighted to be here today at your invitation, but it is also a deep honor for me to be able to speak on behalf of the foundation. So. Um, let me start off there and um, talk about what I think we all know is um, we are in a moment of great excitement. Um, I do think that excitement goes beyond the beltway as people talk about it here in Washington, D.C. Um, certainly, I think 
that as those of us who are working in public health and HIV AIDS in particular, a lot of very exciting uh, dialogue and conversation going on about where will we go with the global health policies um, of the United States and other governments in the future? Will we actually see sort of more intersection of global health policies with international development assistance? I'm not here to answer those questions, but I think those are very dynamic and interesting questions for us. Some of that debate started even several months ago. It's been going on for years, actually, but I think has been uh, more focused through the campaigns and now through uh, the selection of various people uh, filling key posts. I also think it's an exciting time as we think about, again, a renewed focus here in the United States as President-elect Obama uh, has committed to developing a domestic AIDS plan. Um, as Steve said, the foundation uh, has its roots here in the United States. We continue to be very active here in the United States in terms of public policy and advocacy. Uh, and certainly the development of a domestic AIDS plan is important to us as it fits together with the kind of national AIDS plans that we work with in so many countries around the world. I can certainly assure you that the voice of the foundation will be heard uh, as the domestic AIDS plan is developed, and our voice will be heard uh, around the children uh, who are affected by this disease. Um, we also know, as we stand here today, as Steve alluded to, that we are standing in the midst of some uncharted waters uh, in terms of the financial times. And again, if I can just go back to Steve's kind introduction, having spent 20 years in the private sector, in the for-profit sector, and in particular in corporate finance, I can say that this is an experience like most of us who know the finance world have never seen. So the challenges are many. I think the answers are uh, yet to unfold and are going to take a great deal of thinking. Um, I'm also going to start off today by uh, trying to bring a focus here, very much a focus, to uh, Steve's introduction around prevention of mother-to-child transmission. I hope you will allow me uh, in this uh, segment, since I see so many faces, very knowing faces, to use the acronym of PMTCT. I know in Washington we get overwhelmed by acronyms, but I think it will work here this morning. Um, let me try to set the stage for a moment. Uh, one of my favorite writers is the columnist Tom Friedman of the New York Times. And in Sunday's op-ed page, uh, Tom quoted a well-known American inventor. And here's what he said. And I'm going to take a little bit of literary license and take that quote from a financial context to where we are and what we're going to talk about today. Um, this was the American inventor Dean Kamen, and he said, quote, you can bail out a bank you can't bail out a generation. So what I'd like to put in front of you today is a bit of disagreement with that quote and tell you that, in fact, I do think that we can bail out a generation. And the lens that we're going to use to focus that is through PMTCT. That, in fact, we're going to talk today about a vision for creating that generation free of HIV through PMTCT. I know we all know in this room that HIV AIDS is a very complicated issue. Many facets come into the HIV AIDS arena. In, in the world of PMTCT, we have major issues to address in terms of early infant diagnosis, in terms of many of the challenges around care and treatment, be it how many, how many regimens of the, of the uh, treatment uh, protocols are available and where. So I'm just trying to say there are many complications to the HIV AIDS issues. But again, I'm going to try to focus us today through PMTCT. I'm happy to answer any number of questions about the broader context in Q&A. So let's take a focus and talk about PMTCT. And I'm going to start off by saying that we know that PMTCT has been both a success, and also a failure. Why is PMTCT so important? We've been talking about PMTCT. We've been working on PMTCT for 20 years. And in fact, the foundation is now in its 20th year. We've started an enormous number of pilot projects. We've now begun to see some of those projects come to scale. And yet it's kind of interesting as we read some of the very current articles around the challenges 
in scaling up and moving forward in round two of PEPFAR and, and expanding the programs where we've been working for several years. And what we find in many of these articles is that PMTCT is sort of a one-liner. You know, I find as I read the articles, I go scouring for the look at PMTCT, and what do I find? I find a statement that says, oh, you know, and PMTCT is effective, and in fact, it's, it's expanding, but then the authors move on and spend the rest of the time writing or talking about the challenges in other parts of HIV and AIDS. Yet we know that 90% of the new infections in children are through mother-to-child transmission. So the first study, just to go back in history for those of you, and many of you probably know this very well, but just a reminder, the first study to prove that PMTCT was possible was the ACTG study 076. And that was completed in 1993 and published in 1994. Within two years of the completion of that study, PMTCT was widely implemented in the United States, and we know that the mother-to-child transmission rates dropped by at least 50% within two years. Known information, known intervention, and effect. About today, many of you know this, but I'm going to repeat it. Today, about 100 babies in the United States are born HIV positive. So we have a proven, simple, inexpensive prevention method. Let me now focus on three key issues. First, no surprise to you in this room will be children, the mission of the foundation. Second will be the challenges. And I just want to quote a wonderful person in this uh, field, Peter Piot. Again, recently in the New York Times quoted, Peter said, it is not the what that is lacking in preventing AIDS. It is the how to organize it that is key. I'll come back to that. And number three, I want to talk about the vision, our vision, a collective vision of eradication of pediatric HIV and AIDS. I'm going to start with the children. Children have been grossly neglected in the global response to HIV and AIDS. Just a couple of my personal experiences. I was going into one of the program countries recently and handed the immigration officer my passport and he asked me what I was going to be doing in that country. And I told him I was there to work on pediatric AIDS. And the immigration officer looked at me and there was a pause and he said, I didn't know children got AIDS. That was just a few months ago. I was then being interviewed by the producer of a major radio program here in the United States um, in preparation for going on air. And as I was telling the producer what I was going to talk about, she paused and looked at me and said, I didn't know that an HIV positive mom could have a negative baby. Okay. Um, put very bluntly, I guess, that's a failure to communicate or a failure to help people understand. Elizabeth Glazer created this foundation 20 years ago. With two of her best friends, she created the foundation after the death of her daughter. Elizabeth, you may remember, contracted HIV through a blood transfusion, which she received during the birth of her first child, Ariel. Uh, Elizabeth subsequently gave birth to a son, Jake. When Ariel died of AIDS prior to her ninth birthday, Elizabeth created the foundation, largely because she really felt that children were being left behind. There were no medications to help keep Ariel alive at that time. Where are we today? The international efforts of the foundation that Steve alluded to started in 1999, largely through a $1 million private donation for a call to action program. Now, of course, the efforts of PMTCT, the foundation, and many other partners is part of a global effort reaching millions of moms and their families around the world. As I said, Elizabeth started the foundation 20 years ago. 
And through Elizabeth's voice, both here on Capitol Hill and around the country, the efforts to really find the solutions to prevention of mother-to-child transmission came forward. Now let me go to a recent dinner in South Africa that I had with a wonderful colleague, uh, Florence Mobaney. Florence is um, a young HIV positive woman and a few years ago Florence had a daughter. Uh, Florence did not know when she gave birth to her daughter that she, Florence, was HIV positive and in fact transmitted the disease to her child. And it was only when her child died that Florence learned her own status. Florence then entered into uh, one of the programs that the Foundation works uh, on in South Africa. Florence now, today, is remarried um, and has a healthy HIV-negative son after coming through one of the Foundation's PMTCT programs. The echoes of Elizabeth and the echoes of the importance of prevention of mother-to-child transmission are very real. Florence said to me at dinner, when I lost my daughter, she said I cried for a very long time. Then I decided to stand up and try to make a difference. And Florence is now working with moms in clinics as a counselor to try to help those HIV positive moms have negative babies. The foundation has worked here domestically in public policy and advocacy and very recently we worked with many organizations represented here in this room in coalition on the reauthorization of PEPFAR. One of the very clear points we worked for and got in the reauthorized bill is there is a specific target for the scale up of prevention of mother to child transmission programs and that target is that we will reach 80 percent of the women who need those services. The truth is, though, that this pandemic continues to affect the very youngest of the population. Every day in the developing world, 1,000 children become infected with HIV. Every day. I just said that 100 children a year, about 100 children a year, are infected in the United States a year, and 1,000 children a day. And yet, and therein lies the example, PMTCT has actually been a failure. There just are not enough stories like Florence's. And the primary barriers to the global scale up, they don't stem from clinical science. They really come from the failures of implementation. If I go back to what Peter Piot said, it is not about the what, it is about the how we're doing it. The first study to prove PMTCT could be delivered in resource-poor settings was HIVNET-012, and those results were available 10 years ago, 1999. You would have thought that we would have, would have had an enormous revolution worldwide in terms of being able to use PMTCT. But here we are, 10 years later, and two-thirds of the women in low- and middle-income countries that need these services are not getting them. Two-thirds. Nearly 370,000 new pediatric infections are, incurring, are occur, occurred rather in 2007 in low- and middle-income countries. 370,000 last year alone. Or in 2007, I sorry. That represents, by the way, 15% of all new infections. 270,000 children died of AIDS-related illnesses in 2007. The only word I can use for that is tragic. Think of it this way. Think of PMTCT and the intervention for PMTCT as a vaccine. Okay? We know that it's effective, and we know that it's safe, and it's proven. So what do we need to do now? We need to be able to show scale, that we can take these programs to scale, and we need to say that we can do it efficiently and cost-effectively. That brings us to the challenges. I'd like to challenge all of us in this room 
and certainly all of us who work in partnership in pediatric HIV AIDS, PMTCT, and HIV AIDS in general. I'm going to challenge all of us, including the foundation, to think bigger and to think beyond ourselves. We have to move these programs beyond incremental increases. You know, many of us put together our one-year COPS or country operating plans under certain funding sources. We put together three-year plans, and we look at incremental increases. That is not good enough. We also have to look at the issues of integration, addressing so many of the variable factors that the people that we work with live in. Steve mentioned earlier that my husband and I served in the United States Peace Corps, and it was just 10 years ago. And we lived in a, ve we were older volunteers. <laughs> we lived in a very resource poor setting. And do you know that every one of our neighbors, contiguous neighbors and in our village, just about everyone had experienced the loss of a child. I didn't know that in my life just 10 years ago. Now what we need to look at, and again the debate is being engaged, is around the integration of HIV AIDS programs and maternal and child health programs. This is a debate we must enter openly, and we must look to why and how that can help our programs expand and be more effective. Several articles in the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association recently have really begun to engage this discussion, and it is a very, very important one. As currently structured, we know that PMTCT programs have been successful. I do want to highlight some of the successes. It was only 10 years ago that there were many people who said that we could never reach moms in a rural setting. And for those of you who work in those settings or travel to those settings as I do, you know it is working. And women walk, and get, walk long distances and get to those facilities. We know overall, based on the numbers from uh, UNICEF, that PMTCT, the coverage has increased significantly over the last several years, from less than 15% of the women who need the services to now over 30%. Yes, that's a success. But you know what I'm going to say. We now need to do a whole lot more. Still, two-thirds of the women are not receiving the services. You know, it's kind of interesting that just on Friday, um, there was a meeting uh, panel, PMTCT expert panel, that actually was called for in the PEPFAR legislation. That meeting took place this past Friday here in Washington, D.C. And if I can take a little bit of unofficial reporting out of that meeting, because I was there for the full day, I would say that panel of experts certainly agreed that facility-based care is not enough and that's certainly the way that PMTCT has been structured so far, including the work at the foundation. Not only do we need to be able to reach out to the communities in very creative and effective ways, we also need to engage caregivers beyond those caregivers that might be defined in the purely facility-based context or clinical context. So how do we move forward? Are there concrete steps? What, what kind of plan can we put forward? I'd like to share with you the vision and certainly the major concepts around a plan. I want to invite you to really move into the vision, share the vision with us, and look to the possibility of a generation free of HIV. The foundation is actually working on a proposal now that really focuses on a three to five year multi-country, multi-partner plan that is designed to build on existing investments. It's based on lessons learned. It is evidence-based. The good news is, and I heard this at the PMTCT panel on Friday, we have a lot of evidence. We have a lot of information. What we haven't done is shared that information effectively across the board. The point of the plan that we're talking about, the vision that we're asking you to embrace, is that in fact in three to five years in a few countries we could actually demonstrate scale up. We could have enough evidence to be able to talk about where the differences are, where certain strategies work in certain settings, and where we need to make mid-course adjustments. But I also need to tell you that we need to move beyond what we call the process measures 
we need to be able to build in to this kind of plan the impact measures. And what does that mean? How many of those babies who are born HIV negative stay negative and live a healthy life? And how many of those moms who are positive can stay alive and raise those babies in a healthy family setting? PMTCT, as I mentioned, is not only effective, but it's also cost efficient, cost effective. In fact, the recent articles in, in JAMA, um, particularly uh, the study that was reported by Denny and Emmanuel, um, talked about the fact that if you look at cost effectiveness ratios for PMTCT, they are in fact uh, as cost effective as interventions for the diseases of many children, the diseases that kill many children, including respiratory diseases, diarrheal diseases. So in fact, we know that the interventions for PMTCT are cost effective. What else should we be thinking about in developing the generation free plan? We know, and we've talked about this again through the development of PEPFAR2, that we also need to look for a greater balance between prevention and treatment. How many times have so many of my colleagues stood here and said, we're not going to treat our way out of this disease? We know that one out of every six new infections is in a child. We also need to talk about funding. That's sort of the elephant in the room that hangs over everything. Yes, scale up is going to take more funding. I know that Ambassador Dybul has stood here. I've heard him as I sat in the audience, and I've heard him in, as I sat in other audiences. Um, that U.S. government funding, public funding, is only one part of that very important uh, triple-legged stool, three-legged stool. Public funding is critical and the commitment certainly to the long-term funding. But private funding from corporations, private foundations, and individuals is also critically important. And the proposal that we're working on right now at the foundation is designed to build on many investments that have gone before, including at the foundation, public and private funding. But we are also looking for significant private funding for the kind of plan we're talking about, three to five year multi-country, multi-partner plan. There is no doubt that this cannot happen with public funding alone. Let me put one other challenge to this group, and it is what I want to call moving beyond the partnership rhetoric. I can almost guess that if I went around this room and asked each of you for your definition of partnership, we might get as many definitions as there are people in the room. I have to say, as I've talked about successes and failures in PMTCT, I think the ability or demonstrating that we've really created meaningful partnerships that are going to make a difference in scale up of these programs is yet again another failure in PMTCT. I call it the ownership culture. And I, as the CEO of the foundation, will take responsibility for our having our own dose of the ownership culture. And I'm going to put forward to you that until all of us working collectively in this area pick our heads up and stop looking down at what we might consider to be our programs, and until we pick our heads up and start looking left and right for creative, important ways to partner with others working in this area, to really share the common goal that we can scale up PMTCT programs in effective and efficient ways, it won't happen. And we are challenging ourselves to break through that ownership culture. It's not going to be easy. You know, 20 years, 10 years working in programs, we do feel like there are programs. I would suggest to you that there are a couple of very important components to partnerships. And first and foremost, as I've traveled around to so many of our program countries, you know that we have to have the political will of the leaders in the country. How effective it was to be in northern Tanzania about a year ago at a clinic and be told that because President Kikwete and the First Lady had gone on national television to be tested for HIV, that suddenly the lines at the clinics and even some of the most remote and rural areas had doubled and tripled in size and some of the clinics had even run out of, out of the uh, test kits. 
You know, that's a political will. We've seen success in programs in Botswana and Rwanda. We certainly have to say that both of those countries have shown political will. The necessary component to any partnership is political will and leadership in the country. But then I think we really have to look to integrating the partnerships as I was just discussing, integrating across international NGOs, national organizations, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. And we have to really look to further integration, either for different services to support moms and their families, or in order to really share that common goal of scale up. I'd like to propose to you that a year from now, five years from now, certainly five years from now, this room could look very different in the context of talking about PMTCT. I'd like to suggest to you that there would be few of us from the international NGOs that would be here talking about the programs, and it would be our country partners, be it the leaders of the Ministry of Health or the government themselves, or the national partners who would be here talking about how effective scale-up programs are. We at the foundation might serve in a technical assistance role in that kind of model, but we would be able to support the implementation of those programs and allow the local partners to really take the lead. We know that the Generation Free Plan really needs to focus on expanding the coverage of services, and there are a few issues that we know are very effective. For example, we know that opt-out testing works. We have the data to support that. Opt-out testing where women are actually given an HIV test as part of a normal routine testing cycle in a facility. We've seen, we have data, the tests have been done, studies have been done to show that when a policy is changed at the national level to include opt-out testing, the number of women who actually know their status increases significantly. We also know that when moms can deliver in facilities, clearly the ability to reach those babies and provide them with the antiretroviral treatment they need is greatly improved. But how many of the countries we work in where fewer than 50% of the women actually deliver in a facility? So the foundation has actually worked on and piloted in the last few years a program to provide those moms with a take-home dose uh, for PMTCT. Again, data's there. We know that those programs work. But one of the great challenges we face at the foundation, and I think a valid criticism of us and others who've been doing this work for several years, we have focused on facility-based services. We now need to be able to move beyond those facilities into the communities to reach the women who need the services. We also have to work very closely with our partners and our colleagues at organizations like WHO. Again, I mentioned one of the impact measures is making sure that that HIV-positive mom is kept alive and is healthy. There's a lot of work going on right now in terms of providing antiretroviral treatments to moms while they're pregnant. When do they get those services? When do they go on those treatment cycles? So again, I think very important issues have to be taken in terms of how we can improve the survival rates of moms. We do know that the best medicine for a child, an HIV-negative child, is to have a healthy mom. We have to also, in this vision of an HIV-free generation, keep in mind a strong and significant emphasis on research and evaluation programs. We have to be able to measure not only the impact, but we also have to look for the interim measures, the interim outcome measures. As we are talking at the foundation with a few private donors who are interested in looking at the plan for a generation free, the donors are asking us for the management tools to be able to learn early on and make mid-course corrections in these plans. You know, many of us have worked in plans either because they're donor-driven ideas or our own, where we, we build the data for years, several years, before we actually can get that data and do something with it. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done with our research and evaluation people, first on defining the impact measures, but also giving us the tools to make these kind of mid-course corrections. So let me try to conclude. This is a very exciting time. I think with the willingness and the opportunity to debate how we can improve 
upon what we've been doing. With the availability of data, evidence-based information, we have tools to really look at how we can improve. We think it is absolutely critical to bring the focus to PMTCT. As I said to you earlier, imagine if we had a vaccine and we weren't using it. We have the equivalent of a vaccine with PMTCT and we're not using it enough. It's proven, it's safe, and as my colleague Nick Hellman's, Hellman likes to say, it's cheap. So, three major points. Focus on the kids. We just can't continue to leave the kids behind. The challenges are there, but we can't lose momentum. And I think you can share the vision of a generation free of HIV. So we can, in fact, bail out a generation. I just want to conclude by sharing a quote from Elizabeth Glazer, which is truly one of my favorite and I always find very motivating. She said, sometimes in life there is that moment when it's possible to make a change for the better. I believe this is one of those moments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, there's a lot that you've presented this morning. Um, one of the things that just jumps out to me is I mean, the fund, there, there are two things that I think you're struggling with here, the experiences of the last decade. One is, why is it so difficult to reach pregnant women? And why has it proven to be, I think many of us are surprised that, that this has been the case. Maybe we shouldn't be. And why is it that children become forgotten more easily than, than perhaps we've realize too. I think there's surprise, there's a continual sort of surprise at rediscovering these facts. And I, I think your arguments are really around trying to, to transcend those enduring problems based on, I think, what you're saying as a sort of, there's been enough progress and enough learning and there's been a sea change in thinking, I take it, that the plan that you're developing today, you think, offers the opportunity to, to, to have a step forward that would step across those two big obstacles. Then. So those are just two broad uh, reactions. Let me invite three or four of our audience members to offer brief comments and questions. Janet, you had your hand up. Please, uh, there's microphones. Please identify yourself and please be very succinct. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Janet Fleischman with the uh, Global Health Policy Center. And I've done a lot of work on this very issue of integration. And I think this is an interesting segue perhaps to what Steve was raising because we know some of the reasons why women are not accessing services. And it involves what you were alluding to at the start. How does this link with the broader development agenda? What are the issues that they confront? What kind of violence issues, stigma issues, economic abandonment issues? when they are the ones who are first diagnosed because they are the ones who are the, uh, having access to those health facilities and therefore often accused of bringing the virus home even if they weren't the first ones infected. So I wonder if you could talk for a minute about any of your programs because I know having visited a number of them in many countries and we're doing fabulous work, but they, they're different in different countries and maybe there are some that you could highlight for us where some of these other development issues either in terms of the violence issues or the economic issues or the family planning issues and reproductive health more broadly, where those are factoring into some of your programming options. Yes, good morning. Okay, great, thanks. My name is Michelle Brummelsick. I serve as the AIDS Relief Chief of Party with Catholic Relief Services. And I was just struck in your stories by um, remembering myself out in Southern Africa visiting a clinic 
and meeting a mother and child who were getting treated and finding out that the mother was HIV negative and the five-year-old daughter was HIV positive. And I just wanted to ask a little bit more about what your thinking is in EGPATH about how to deal with violence against children and how that plays into these kind of programs for um, preventing um, child HIV, children who are HIV positive. Thank you. Yes, right in front. Pavel de Jesus, I'm with the Office of the Governor of Puerto Rico. Um, you talked about uh, abandoning a sort of individualistic uh, sense of ownership of projects and adopting a more collective approach, certainly vision. But that implies um, dealing with the, the uh, that implies uh, communicating a return on investment to the public sector that isn't as clear as it would be otherwise. Do you have any ideas and strategies for how to maintain that public sector interest in collective initiatives when the ownership element has been downplayed? Thank you. Um, I think I'm right when I say uh, Janet and Michelle, that your questions do overlap a little bit in talking about the many other factors, be they violence against children, violence against women, and how those factors may affect or should be considered in programming around PMTCT. I think, you know, let me, let me try to start an answer to that and we can go further and engage the discussion. I think that fundamentally we've spent the last 10 and maybe five years in the international program implementation of PMTCT, again, bringing forth the data and the information to really show the program's work. I think also the, uh, the fact that over the last five years, treatment has become so much more available, there's so much more education in terms of the ability of people to be treated for their disease and to stay alive with their disease. So I think that collective environment over the last five years has really helped us to get to this point, which is to say really with great evidence that PMTCT programs work, they're effective, uh, and, and uh, can be administered in even the, in resource poor settings. So that's how we got to where we are today. I do think that the, the issues that now need to be connected are all of those issues. I talked about the need to really move into the community-based model. You know, when you're working mostly in a clinical model, in a, in a, a facility-based model, some of the issues that are really most relevant at the community level are not necessarily evident. Um, they come out maybe through counseling, but sometimes not at all, okay? And sometimes you don't see the people that are most affected by those social issues unless you go to the community. They don't surface at the clinical level. So in my, in, in my view, and I think shared by my colleagues at the foundation, is the fact that what we need to do, and need to do uh, in a timely way, so I'm not talking about the next 10 years, I'm talking about fairly soon, we need to really, you know, kind of build those tracks to connect, right? So it's, it's moving from the facility-based work out to the community-based work where we have to broaden the context of the delivery of services. I don't think we could be at that point of discussion without having gone through the effort of knowing, showing, bringing the evidence to the governments where we are working that in fact this inter intervention is effective, okay? So I do think though, and I'm trying to do that in, in the context of the next three to five years, we must at least identify the context to be able to make those pieces connect, right? And I think that's a tremendous challenge. I'll come back now and connect that, Pablo, to your question. Um, how it, Given the fact that we're going to be moving to a community-based model, that we're also talking about connecting on a partnership level, how do we affect the accountability of organizations? Okay. Um, call me the optimist, and I'm not an epidemiology uh, person, I'm a numbers person, but 
I do believe that if we share the common goal and can show the impact, and that impact I talked about in terms of keeping babies alive and keeping their mothers alive so that you have a healthy family unit, if we can bring forward the impact measures in a program to show that that can happen effectively and efficiently, and I want to come back to cost effectiveness in a minute, I really do believe that we can find the communication tools to do that. Um, with national governments, with funders, with, you know, with donors and other constituencies to whom we need to explain that. I would argue with you, I would argue, not with you, I would argue that we've not done a great job at all in this area in terms of talking about cost effectiveness or impact. We haven't done it. We're very good at process measures. And I, again, I, I'll take this to the foundation and be self-critical. We are reaching over a million women a year, but you've all seen those cascades. I, you know, again, I say to my colleagues, not trying to be flip at all, so what happens after the end of that cascade? That's the impact, okay? If we can show impact and we can do it with cost data, we will find a way to help our colleagues who are at the national levels of government, funders, be they public or private which I think brings us to the challenge which is at hand, as I mentioned, trying to get more funding for this area. We all know that the funding, we all know. I should say that we feel very strongly that the balance between prevention funding and treatment funding has not quite been reached yet, okay? But I think part of the blame for that is we need to bring forward the cost effectiveness of an intervention like PMTCT, right? And we haven't done that effectively. We've not communicated it well. We haven't brought forward the data. And in order to really bring on new donors to this area, we at least have to make the commitment to bring forward that costing information soon. Peter McDermott said in the PMTCT panel meeting on Friday that he really felt the development of the cost measures was an imperative. Did that answer your question? Uh-huh. In front here. You. Oh, sorry. I'm Ann Heyer with the American College of Nurse Midwives. You've mentioned quite a few times about the community-based model, and you also briefly mentioned a take-home dose that has shown some promise or the, the use of a take-home dose that, is, that has shown promise. I'm wondering if you could talk about just very briefly or point me in a direction of where I might be able to gather additional information for what other community-based models appear to be showing some promise for getting PMTCT out of the facility perhaps and, and more of a community-based model. Mm -hmm. Hold on just for a second. Right in front here. Did she just ask your question? How the emphasis of going beyond the facility, how that changes your priorities and I'm Peter Goldstein. I work for Intermedia. We do project evaluation work in Africa and elsewhere. Um, just how the, it seems like a major shift in some ways, and what sort of lessons are being learned? How, how do you need to reorient to, to, to focus on that? Right here. Thank you, Yusuf Tafik with IPM. Question, of course, I agree about the focus on the children. However, from the point of view of the mother, I think it's also important to give mothers hope that uh, when they um, uh, enroll in PMTCT programs that they will, this will be an entry point for them to start enrolling them in treatment that will benefit them uh, themselves as HIV positive individuals. Okay. Um. Thank you uh, for the question um, on uh, sort of the community-based models, which I hear uh, both. Um, I think that we have community-based models that are not specific to PMTCT, okay? And, um, you know, I, I couldn't sit here and tell you of uh, specific models on PMTCT. I'm sure there are some, and I can certainly um, – uh, direct you to some of the folks at the foundation who may know that. But, but, but 
I believe it's fair to say that at the moment anyway, we don't have good data, good evidence on uh, community-based models. Again, I think that's the imperative here, though. I mean, if we look at data, for example, I talked about the fact that PMTCT has increased uh, in its outreach over the last two years from 2007 uh, from about 14 percent coverage to 34 percent coverage. That's really based on the increase in services at facilities. Okay. I think the worry that many of us have is that there, that could become in and of itself a ceiling um, in light of the, the challenges we have around the number of women who deliver at home versus in a facility and so forth. So um, I don't think we have many models. Again, I think there may be some that I'm just not aware of. But I think, again, the imperative here is that we begin to look to programs, other programs, not PMTCT programs necessarily. But I also think it's in the linkages to, again, maternal and child health services, vaccine programs, and back to a question that was asked over here that I'll come back to, what is the point of entry for, for moms and babies into medical care? And some of those are very community-based. And I think that's what we have to look to. It's not necessarily the specific PMTCT model that says here's how it's going to work, but we have to look to the other entry points at the community level where moms and babies come to, to light. So it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. I can't say it any other way. And I don't think that there's, um, there's going to be at all a one-size-fits-all. I think we're going to have to really work at the community levels in connecting with community-based organizations to find out what can work and what can be implemented. So let me just go back to kind of the mid-course correction idea. I think it also means that we've got to set up those kinds of programs in a way where we can look at data quickly uh, within months. Um, to see whether or not it looks as if things are working and be able to, to adjust where they're not. But that's also an area where I think partnerships are critical. Who's working at the community level? I mean, we, I don't think, at the foundation could turn around and say we're going to build the infrastructure to work at a, par at, a, at a community level. That would take years to do, years to do. And so we really have to look at who we can work with who knows how to work at that level, and how can we support those efforts through PMTCT? Uh, now, let me go back. You were asking about, I believe, kind of the integrated services for women. So once a woman comes into, into the system, let's say, for PMTCT, um, when I talk about an integrated plan, I, that really speaks to the issue not only of the availability of comprehensive services for women, from family planning to nutrition for moms to well baby care to family care. Certainly we have to be looking at that in the HIV context, but it must be an entry into the health care system the total health care system. In some of our countries, like Tanzania, for example, we've wor worked in close partnership and helped build family-centered care programs. Um, and those are meant to be integrated uh, into the health system. Um, again, you know, we all know, that each and every country has its own unique characteristics in how they define their health care system. How can we come back and look to integrating HIV AIDS care in the first instance and then making sure that what the integrated services are are complete so that, again, that mom can be treated for her own disease? I want to go back to the WHO discussion, which I heard again on Friday. I was talking to Kevin DeCock and others who were here for the PMTCT expert panel. And again, there's some urgency being put back to WHO about reevaluating the guidelines for recommending when pregnant women who are HIV positive can be put on heart. And there's an urgency to that because the studies that are coming out right now are showing that a healthier mom, a mom whose disease is, is under control uh, in terms of her virus, viral loads, a mom who is healthier can have, a, the chances of her having a healthier outcome with her baby are greatly increased. So that debate is important. Um, the WHO panel that was convened in November has really put a highlight and an emphasis on reviewing those guidelines soon. What you're laying out, this vision you're laying out goes against the grain in multiple ways, right? You're saying you're going against a clinic bias, 
you're going against a treatment bias, you're going against the ownership culture and the aversion to real collaboration, you're going against the tendency to underinvest in tracking and monitoring, and you're going against the pessimism or skepticism the private sector is going to make a big play uh, on something like that. So there's sort of five points that you're sort of challenging be it sort of a conventional wisdom around habits or attitudes and the like. And you're saying it's possible to transcend that, that there's some momentum in this expert committee that's come forward in the WHO, that there's, there's some ferment, there's been a big jump from 15% to 35% in some places. Okay, so where are the countries that you would say are the best bets in the next three to five years in actually achieving this kind of transformation that you're talking about. And how do you imagine it being being galvanized and led? I mean, in practical terms. Let's say you say, okay, Tanzania is a good bet, or Zambia is a good bet, or you know, pick, your, pick your case. How do you operationalize that strategy, move beyond the kind of broad committee meetings that you're talking about? scientific and technical experts come together to talk about these things into an actual program that's going to take on all of these things that you're talking about taking on. Um, that's a big question, I realize, but it sort of gets to the heart of what you're proposing, which is that you do believe that there are countries out there where this can be demonstrated to be feasible in the next three to five years and show major results in going from 35% to 80% coverage that has the benefit for both mothers and for children. Mm -hmm. Let me ask this gentleman here also. To Hello, good morning. My name is Raul Gonzalez. I work as a pediatric advisor for the uh, WHO uh, organization, especially in the Pan American Health Organization here in Washington. And just to set a point of what was uh, saying, we are currently reviewing the guidelines. I mean. Uh, you know, the current guidelines are the 2006 guidelines that do not advocate for a heart for every, every woman. The reason that this is not uh, a formal uh, recommendation is that many countries do not have the resources to afford a uh, heart, heart for everybody, for all pregnant women. In, let's say, three, four months, we will have the guidelines for the, for the American for the America, for the region of the Americas, our own guidelines, the PAHO guidelines, these will include, definitely, this will include the recommendation of heart for women, uh, for pregnant women. Mm -hmm. uh, just, and to, just to add some information about, we will have a report, an official report of that meeting in Geneva of November by last, maybe April, and new guidelines of the WHO, maybe for September, October 2009. Great, thank you, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karen Meacham. I'm here at CSIS. Um, I'm interested in the ownership issue, maybe specifically the divide between the national and international efforts. I mean, there are different constituencies, different budgets, different champions, and I'm kind of looking at that gap. And I guess my question is how, back to Peter Piat, you know, how do you organize, how do you encourage cross pollination? and Maybe what is the value of that? Is the gap too wide, or is there a value in integrating those two efforts? Okay. Karen, I think, uh, you know, tell me if you think I'm wrong about this, but I think you're asking in some ways a subset of, of Steve's question, which is, you know, is it possible, as you say, to bridge the divide? You know, Steve sort of laid out five factors, which are all uh, certainly uh, you know, a, a, a fantastic summary of what the challenges are. So let me try to integrate your question um, as I address Steve's. First of all, let me say uh, very carefully here that we have not begun discussions with specific countries just yet. Um, and so I don't want to imply that we've done that. Um, it's very important, we think, that we feel that we have the, um, the vision and the, and the structure ideas 
uh, ready to, to discuss at specific country level, and we're not there yet by any means. And I think that – and there's also a lot of partnership discussion uh, that we need to have, which uh, has, again, only just begun, as well as the funding discussions. Um, but let me come back to those challenges, Steve um, and Karen. Let me go back to how did we get to this point in time, right? And it's not, it's not just a couple of years of program implementation. This is 10 years for the foundation and most of our major partners, at least five years with both public and private funding in many countries. This is beyond PEPFAR. Foundation works in, in 12 countries in sub-Saharan Africa alone. So we have data, we have evidence, we have information to show that these programs are effective. Right? So, so we have a couple of choices in front of us. We can continue to look at incremental improvements or we can identify the five areas as you have where we must face the challenges ahead of us. With the data we have, we believe that we can make a case for addressing each of those areas. Let me go back to the ownership culture idea. As we're working in parallel with organizations that are doing exactly what we're doing, but perhaps side by side, right? If you now look at the goal of scale up, let's keep the goal in mind. We're trying to scale up on a population based, uh, on a population basis, the women, reaching the women who need these services, okay? If you're looking at what you could do in a given environment based on five years or more of experience in that area to help the national government scale up those programs to an 80 percent target, wouldn't you normally look to those partners to begin to figure out what it is you could do to work more effectively and efficiently together? I, I mean, I, I'm just trying to say I think that's an obvious place to go. How successful are, it, are we going to be? We'll see. But to sit and say, well, no one's doing that. No one else is want. You know, we talk to many of our partner organizations, and really the shared goal is there. I think what's missing is the mechanism to really take leadership to, and ownership of the issue of scale-up. That takes me back to the very necessary and critical component of national leadership. It, th this kind of scale-up will not happen without ownership at the national level. I, I mean, I, I can't, the five variables you mentioned are spot on. None of those can be addressed effectively by us, the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, by us and four or five of our major colleagues globally, internationally, domestically, has to have the leadership of the national government. And, and the only thing I can say to you is that that will have to be engaged as we try to take this plan forward with funding. It's interesting that, you know, the, if, if this could be carried forward, the demonstrating a proof of concept rapidly in a couple of cases would be very powerful because you early, earlier in your opening remarks you talked about, you know, we're entering a period of, of rationing of resources in which there's going to be severe stress and threat to existing funding streams. There's, we don't know what, whether there will be what kind of what kind of rebalancing or adjustments or retrenchments will be in force? You're making an argument for self-imposed greater efficiencies in the way organizations collaborate towards a goal, which it seems to me is is is, a, is given the global economic recession and what is likely to be a decline of at least in the medium term a decline of available resources putting the focus back on gr achieving greater efficiencies and showing through in greater investment in tracking, showing the concrete impact results become terribly important in sustaining donor involvement in those areas because it, it, it shows that you're being creative, you're achieving, you're, 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 you're achieving results with less waste, higher, higher collaboration, and you're bringing forward the concrete results because I think there's going to be a dramatic clamor in this next phase for people to prove that they're getting the results for the dollar. 
dollars that are being invested. If you could just comment on those. Yep. I mean, I think the vision you're putting forward is one that fits quite well with the challenges that are fast coming forward upon the entire domain of global health, where resources are going to be more scarce and the pressures to achieve results and show efficiencies are going to be are going to be intensified. Well, you'll have to take a leap of faith for me with me for a moment, Steve, and I'm going to tell you that we we've been having this discussion at the foundation before the, the current financial global financial crisis. That in the next phase, as we were advocating on Capitol Hill for the reauthorization of PEPFAR, and I had the honor and the privilege of sitting across from many members of Congress advocating with them for the increased funding for these programs, I must tell you, and this is over a year ago, so unless people really had the great vision of what was going to happen financially, and I certainly didn't, we didn't think the bottom would have fallen out of the global financial world the way it has. But we were then talking about that the need, the imperative for bringing forward the cost data. I don't think you can take many models of either public health, in the, uh, looking to the private sector for scaling up, whether it's in a business or a service-oriented organization. You cannot look to servicing, to, to increasing a slope of, of outreach or product sales, excuse me, if that's the way you want to look at it, without looking at cost effectiveness. Okay, that's the big piece in our view that's been left over there for a while. And so I agree with you. I think the, we absolutely are looking at a model that brings that back to a responsibility and linking it with the impact. If you're sitting across from a major private donor at this point in time, do you really think that most of those donors, particularly the very largest donors, private donors, you know, they're absolutely going to ask for the kind of information around cost effectiveness. How exactly is it, they say, Mrs. Barnes, that we're going to be able to go from 30 percent to 80 percent at this cost level, even if we give them the broadest cost level about where we are? You know what those, those curves look like. We know what those cost numbers look like when you just extrapolate out from where we are at the grossest level of what's being funded for these programs out into increased coverage. So what's, you know, what do we have to do? We must bring forward that data to show we can do it more cost effectively. So how, how do we do that? And how do we show the impact? That's what we're putting on the table. We are, you're absolutely right, we are saying that that's got to happen in the next phase. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to direct the Q&A. <laughs> I just had to follow up. Um, what that means then in terms of your collaboration with family planning. Because part of the cost efficiency is to reduce the number of positive babies that are born yeah. so that your ability to reach 80% of the women who need it would be uh, more, more feasible. Um, and if one talks to networks of HIV positive women, there's clearly um, a range of services they need. One is to, if they want to have children as safely as possible, to be connected with the services like your own that will enable them to do that and get the services they need, and others who want to space or prevent pregnancy because of their status or because of what they've learned in the process of some of these information, um, uh, points of information. So how then do you build in, if you really want to make a cost efficiency argument, the family planning piece is really essential because that is, of course, much less expensive than providing PMTCT. Mm -hmm. And does that then become part of your argument now that we have to expand access to voluntary family planning for those women who need it to prevent positive babies? I think that we've all been working with very clear guidance around family planning. And yes, we have to provide family planning. I mean, again, I come from a family planning environment, so, you know, I absolutely agree that, if, you know, access to safe and effective plan family planning we know has enormous cost-benefit ratios. I mean, those statistics from the Alan Guttmacher Institute for years, decades, has shown that women will limit the size of their families based on their ability, their economic ability to support those families, and we need to provide them with the options to do that. You know, I, th that data is clear. So, so the challenge is to be sure that the guidelines as they're outlined by WHO, making sure that family planning is, a, is an integral part of not only PMTCT, but it, the basic health services, and that those are there. Very, very important linkage. I don't think there's any question about that. But I think that 
again, the, the broader context, back to Steve's question and, and leading on to yours, is that the, um, the data on cost and the data on partnership and how those partnerships could be cost effective, that still needs to be developed. Okay, I mean, he, let me just give you one conceptual idea, and I'm now going to move off family planning into the broader context. But I don't mean to be flip about this, but you take, you take two major international NGOs working side by side in a, in a program country. We both have offices. We both have vehicles. We both have administrative services, we both have IT needs, we both have all those pieces put together. This is not a new concept, okay? Are there ways to combine some of those efforts, share some of those efforts, and, you know, then take other resources and move them on to, so it's not just the cost effectiveness of the delivery of PMTCT that I'm talking about, I'm talking about also the cost effectiveness of operating in those countries, right? Now, I have to say, even members of staff, and there are a few of them in the audience, you know, the sort of people, get wide-eyed, you know, and think, oh, my God, you know. But, but honestly, if we're going to look at a national plan and sit across from national governments with a combination of public and private donors, if we've got to help look at the complete lay of the land, right? And it's a push. It's a real push. And I have people push back on me all the time and say, oh, my goodness, but, you know, where do the dollars go? Who gets credit for getting the dollars? We'll work that out, right? I mean, I've said to our board of directors at the foundation, truly asked our board of directors at a meeting, I said, what do you think is a measure of success for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation? This was before we did our strategic plan a year and a half ago. And, in fact, members of the board, a few members of the board said, that they thought one measure of success was the increasing revenue of the foundation. And I take great exception to that. I did at the meeting, and I do now. I could make a case that the success of our foundation would be a decreasing revenue stream. And I happen to be one of those people that believe the success of the foundation is I'm not here, nor my successor sitting here at this table talking about pediatric AIDS in 10 years. Okay. So I think it's really that push. That's what I'm talking about. You know, do I stand here with great pride for the work of the foundation, my colleagues around the world? Absolutely I do. Someone said it here maybe in the introduction. It is incredible, the work of this foundation, for those of you who know us over the last 20 years, okay? But I believe that our challenges are now straight ahead of us, straight ahead of us. We cannot rest on our laurels. The goal is very clear. And, and back to your question, we have a known intervention that works. We don't need to, for science, wait to wait for science to tell us what that is. Sorry, that was a little bit of a lecture. <laughs> well, that was very eloquent and powerful. We have time for one more round of questions or comments from anyone in our audience. We haven't exhausted. So well, you're going to ask me another tough one, yeah, is that well, it? <laughs> any more tough questions. <laughs> this has been very rich. Um, and, you know, it's, it also brings forward how, just how important that reauthorization process was as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an opportunity for rethinking and for putting in place a set of ambitions and a process of deliberation that, I mean, I, I take – much of what you're saying here today as an outgrowth of, the, of that very review and the embedding those ambitions into the reauthorization legislation. And now, of course, we're at this moment where the reauthorization was completed in a period of euphoria six weeks before Lehman disappeared. Now we're on the, we're, you know, 120 days on the other side of that, staring out into an uncertain period and wondering, okay, how do we how do we revisit all of those ambitions that were packaged at the end of July and signed into law, which is sort of one of the big, uh, the big challenges. And having your voice and leadership out there and reminding us of all of this is terribly important. And I think your point about leadership, political leadership, applies here at home as well. I think the next administration, 
that comes into power next week has lots of opportunity to push this agenda and to articulate it, be it through Secretary Clinton, be it through the President, be it through others at HHS or elsewhere, and that congressional leadership remains vital on this as well. So thank you so much. This has given us just an enormous amount to think about.